Okay, uh, great. Uh, thank you. Thank you for the introduction. It's uh, great to be here. And thank you very much for um, organizing these seminars. It's uh, fantastic. It's a good way to try to stir, stay positive in these uh, strange times. And, um, and again, uh, I will uh, tell you a bit of the work that we've been doing uh, to try to understand um, the swimming of microorganisms. But we actually, um, we cheat. We don't, we don't actually study microorganisms. We try to extract the physics out of uh, synthetic swimmers. And I will tell you the story about it. And, uh, uh, and again, uh, this uh, work, uh, as, as they said, is part of the other research topics that I have uh, worked on for the, over the years. Uh, and this particular subject uh, um, was introduced to me by Eric Loga, who is somewhere in the audience. Uh, so we've been collaborating, closely collaborating in this subject over the years. But all the work that I'm going to show you today, it's been done by a group of brilliant students, both undergraduate and graduate students, first at, at UNAM, where I used to be, and uh, now at Brown. Uh, so again, this is just a, 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 I will tell you just very briefly of, of these other subjects. Uh, because, you know, if, if, my, if I may seem to you as an outsider, it's probably true. Uh, my, the core of my work uh, was in two-phase flows, is in two-phase flows, uh, but again, you know, from going to conferences and um, talking to Eric, uh, I, it started, I, I got interested in biological fl uh, flows. And also, uh, more recently, I started a new research subject, which is the fluid mechanics of artistic painting, and which is a lot of fun, and I can tell you more about it if you're interested. But first, let me just give you a quick introduction. Again, uh, as um, uh, Dave said, uh, so, so life changes. So you, I was a professor at the National Autonomous University of Mexico for 20 years. And I was, I, I, I'm very proud and very grateful to UNAM for the opportunities that it gave me. Uh, but then, you know, uh, precisely because of this subject, it, the, what I'm gonna talk about today, I was invited to move to Brown and I accepted and I'm, extremely happy with my decision, but let me just give you some numbers just to tell you, uh, so you can guess how I feel these days. So this is the change in the, in the population, you know, you know, Mexico City is one of the largest cities in the world. Uh, so uh, it's about 21 million people in, you know, in this tiny place. Providence is two orders of magnitude smaller. So, you know, life changes. Uh, I'm, I'm originally from Mexico, and this is where the National University of Mexico is. And it's not a poor country, but if you, com if you compare the gross domestic product per capita to, to the United States, it's a significantly uh, different environment to do everything, including research. Uh, the universities, both uh, UNAM and Brown, couldn't be any, different, any more different. Uh, UNAM is a public university, and it's gigantic but in any way you measure it. It has more students than the total population of Providence, which is interesting. And so Brown is a very um, selective private university. And uh, of course, if you do this ratio of the budget per student, it's uh, significantly higher here at Brown. And it's great. It, it allows you to do many other, many, many different things. And again, it's just to, just to give you a mindset of how, how I feel uh, these days. And of course, you know, you need to think about the, the climate. So it turns out that Providence, it's a little bit cooler and it's also hotter, which is kind of interesting because, you know, Mexico City, although it's, it's in Mexico, it's very high up. So it never gets too hot in the, in the summer. So yes, uh, so Brown is one of the oldest universities in the United States. It's part of the Ivy League, which it turns out it's a sports league which, by the way, it's been canceled this for this upcoming season due to these COVID concerns. Brown is located in Providence. Providence is the capital of Rhode Island. Rhode Island is one of the states that uh, conforms uh, New England, which is this region here in the northeast of the United States. And it's, it has a long history, of course. Uh, it's, it's, uh, it's known to be the place where the American Industrial Revolution started. Uh, but also Rhode Island has this quirky sense of humor, which I really enjoy. And its recent history 
uh, it, it's kind of funny, but maybe not so funny, but I found this, uh, somebody wearing this t-shirt the other day, and I, of course, you can, uh, you can find it, you can Google it. So uh, Rhode Island is defined as the Venn diagram of the intersection between mobsters and lobsters. Um, and this is the kind of sense of humor that I enjoy. Anyway, that's, uh, that's just a brief introduction, uh, again, just to, uh, to let you know about my new place, which I'm, I'm very happy to be here. Uh, so, so today I'm going to talk about the locomotion of um, organisms at small Reynolds numbers. And of course, I have borrowed this cartoon from this famous paper by Purcell, in which he discusses uh, what are the implications of trying to move in, a, in, a, in an environment that is dominated by viscous effects. The Reynolds numbers of microorganisms are always very small. That means, again, you know, uh, that the uh, viscous effects dominate uh, um, respect to inertial ones. And this is a, fa a movie by, a famous movie by the, um, uh, the Berg lab in Harvard that shows you uh, a visualization of E. coli bacteria swimming. And it's very, uh, it's, it's a fascinating uh, movie and um, basically shows these bacteria that have a head and they propel themselves using this helical tail. It's, a, it's a, a, a bundle of flagella, which is tremendously complex, uh, but that's the rotation of that is what uh, um, allows these uh, organisms to displace. Um, so how do you actually do this in a low Reynolds number environment? This is, these are the Navier-Stokes equations uh, for the general case, but if there's uh, no inertia and the Reynolds number is very small, you can actually, um, neglect the accelerations of the fluid. So the fluid motion is basically a balance of pressure gradients and the opposition that the viscosity opposes to those pressure gradients. Uh, so time, uh, the one interesting aspect of these equations uh, is that uh, time, uh, the flow is reversible. Time doesn't matter. You can go back and forth in time and still see the same solution. Uh, so with this uh, idea that time is uh, reversible, if you were to do a, a certain swimming strategy in which you have um, a flapping device, uh, the fluid would go back and forth in time. And this it was used by Purcell to, to come up with this uh, so-called Scalop theorem that if you have reciprocal motion, simple reciprocal motion, as it would do, as, it, as a tail of a fish would do, then you would not be able to move. So let me show you an example of that. In case you're not familiar uh, with the subject of low Reynolds numbers, um, uh, this is a, a, an experiment done by one of my students uh, in which we have a, a, a flapping, a flapper, uh, basically a, a rigid um, beam, which is immersed in a highly viscous fluid. And of course we have these this, uh, fluid tracers that are illuminated with a laser sheet. It's the classical PIV setup. Which what I like about this is that it's a very good example of how things look like in such an environment, right? So if you look at the position of the flapper, once it stops, the fluid around it stops immediately. So there's no inertia, right? So if, if you were to, if this were the tail of a fish, this fish would not swim anywhere. And again, it's, I like this video because it's, it's, very, in, it's very clear what is the type of physics that you, are, you have to deal with and when, you have, when the Reynolds number is very small. So I borrowed this, uh, this cartoon from, from Eric's paper uh, in which he talks about the hydrodynamics of um, bacterial locomotion. And again, this is a cartoon that uh, tells you how bacteria, uh, fl uh, flagellated organisms, um, actually achieve this locomotion, right? They have so several filaments, uh, several flagella that bundle to form these uh, helical propellers. Uh, and of course, they have these very complex motors and they have this hook and the, the mechanics of this is fascinating, but it's very complex. And um, so we try to learn some of uh, what, what we're going to do in this talk. We're going to extract some basic elements of this complexity to understand uh, locomotion in complex environments. This is another figure from Eric's paper. Again, you know, the, this, uh, this is the simplest case, but of course, there's a, a wide variety of, of flagellated animals 
that use this um, strategy to move in a, in a viscous fluid. Of course, uh, for the case of a Newtonian fluid, this um, the way you achieve locomotion has been studied um, since the 50s and is well understood. Uh, so you can actually uh, explain why a chiral element, a helix uh, that undergoes rotation, is able to produce certain propulsive force just by its geometry, and it's, it results from the an, an isotropy of drag. I will not go into the details of that, but basically, if you have an inclined element and you displace it vertically, the resulting force is not aligned with the motion. It has a certain a horizontal component, and that horizontal horizontal component is what leads to locomotion, right? This horizontal component with respect to this rotation uh, propels the, the helix uh, forward. And again, there's been many investigations in this subject and who is who in fluid mechanics worked in this subject uh, back then. Uh, but now, uh, the next um, step of complexity, the next uh, direction of complexity in which we want to achieve some understanding is the fact that most biological fluids are non-Newtonian. And this is just an example from the um, um, reproductive system in which the sperm have to travel through several different environments uh, in which the fluid that surrounds them as they, they, they swim along, uh, it's non-Newtonian. It's a either elastic or shear thinning. And what we want to understand is what is the effect of having a non-Newtonian fluid that has non-Newtonian rheology on the swimming performance at this small Reynolds number uh, environment, right? And again, uh, and I just wanted to highlight that uh, this is how I, ent I entered this field. And um, I started this, uh, uh, I became interested in this subject by, because I met Eric Loga in Toulouse. We were both invited professors at the Institute for Fluid Mechanics in Toulouse, and we shared an office. And this was, I was checking yesterday, it was um, 2010 or 2011. So we were discussing which was the best place to buy a good kebab in Toulouse. We were also talking about music. Uh, and then, you know, he started telling me about his efforts to understand this problem. And that was very inspiring. So we started uh, talking and we've been collaborating since then. Okay, let me just uh, give you some um, introduction about what I, uh, what is my approach to rheology. I'm not really a rheologist. I'm more of a non-Newtonian fluid mechanicist. So a non-Newtonian fluid is essentially that one that in which the viscosity, the stress is not linearly proportional to viscosity and uh, strain rate. Uh, and this, that the, basically every fluid is non-Newtonian if you think about it this way. However, what we normally think about in a model non-Newtonian fluids, uh, they can be classified in two broad um, categories. One is a viscoelastic fluid in which the stress and the strain rate are related with these time constants. This um, triangle here is um, uh, it's basically a, a derivative, an upper convective derivative of this. So both um, stress and strain are related to the history of the stress and, and uh, strain rate tensors. And the other idea, uh, the other broad idea of non-Newtonian rheology is the case in which the, the viscosity is not a constant, but it's itself a function of how much the fluid is being deformed, continuously deformed. And again, so this would be a shear dependent viscosity fluid, right? The complication that we have when we study non-Newtonian fluids, uh, biological non-Newtonian fluids, in which we, we want to understand the swimming of microorganisms, is that these two physically different effects uh, appear simultaneously. So it's very hard to just to, to do an experiment or to do an analysis of a swimming or any flow that has the two things happening at the same time. Uh, because they can mask each other. And that's what we, we will try to do with this, um, uh, with the type of uh, uh, investigations that we do. And of course, this 
uh, this uh, question that I posed at the beginning of my talk, uh, has, many people have asked themselves the same question. And this is just a, a, a partial summary of people who have uh, worked in this. So, uh, and the, the, um, I will just phrase it in these simplified terms, right? So what you can argue that the non-Newtonian rheology may lead to an enhanced swimming speed of a, an organism, or it might, it might be hindered. So it, it, can, it can move faster or it can move slower in a viscoelastic or shear thinning fluid, or maybe both, right? So, um, you know, I didn't do, a, I didn't do a survey, but basically we're half, half. Some people have found that the swimming can be enhanced. Some people have found um, that the swimming speed is decreased by the non-Newtonian character of the fluid. But some people, and uh, some of our investigations too, we have found both, right? So there is not a general answer, not a simple answer to this uh, relatively simple question. Yeah? So, so, so what I'm gonna show you today Again, there are different efforts of our group uh, to try to answer that question. So how we do that? Uh, again, this is a, a cartoon of a model uh, bacteria. And as I said, it's tremendously complicated. It has a head, it has a bundle of flagella, it has cilia on its head. Uh, uh, so we want to extract the, the, the fundamental parts of this organism and its locomotion uh, to try to understand how it does it, right? So, of course, as in every scientific subject, you can think in terms of three different uh, ways to approach this problem. Uh, of course, you can do theory, but theory is limited to certain simplified cases. Uh, when, when the theory gets complicated, then you can turn into numerical simulations. Again, the, the simulation simulations are fantastic, are great. They teach you many things, but they need a lot of validation. In particular, uh, in the, for the particular case of non-Newtonian uh, fluid mechanics, the numerical validations, the numerical simulations still need a lot of validation, right? So um, uh, since we are experimentalists, we rely on experiments. So we want to contribute. We want to study these systems by conducting experiments, but now, Okay, do experiments, but you can go two different ways. And the, the, the talks in this series have taught us very different ways to approach uh, this problem experimentally. You can choose to go uh, to use uh, live uh, organisms and have this sperm or bacteria swimming in their environment and you do observations from that. And that can be very complicated, very involved, uh, experimental procedures to learn to observe how these organisms move. So the, the way we chose to approach this problem is basically just cheating, just doing something uh, different, just extract certain important features of this locomotion by building uh, synthetic swimmers, swimmers that are not alive, swimmers that are not microscopic, uh, but they we hope they retain a certain uh, the important physics of the motion, right? So this we go again from uh, microorganisms like, uh, like this, a, a very small Reynolds number, to something like this. Uh, we have a, a head, we have a, a tail, and we can design this. This is something uh, we can extend the way the mechanics of these uh, organisms to a wider range of parameters. We can design the shape of the head, we can change the the, the, the length, the pitch angle, everything, we can change the size and importance of the head. And again, this gives a broad perspective and then we can focus back in on what is important for microorganisms. So uh, we, we make them bigger such that we, need, we don't need to buy a microscope. They swim at a higher speed, of course, and we keep the Reynolds number small, hoping that we retain this uh, creeping flow uh, environment. So, I will show you uh, how we make these synthetic devices. I will show you how we construct these fluids such that we can separate viscoelastic or shield thinning effects um, uh, to study this. Uh, and I will show you two results on uh, helical swimmers, which are the, how these helical swimmers swim with visc viscoelastic and shield thinning fluids. And I will uh, show you the um, the next step, the next um, 
part of the story is that we make the swimmers to swim across interfaces and gradients. And the other thing that I'm going to show you, uh, if I have sufficient time, is uh, this thing that I love. This is going off tangents. You, you, we have uh, come up with this way to study microorganisms, but then by doing that, we have been inspired to do many other fun, important, I hope, uh, projects. So we go off tangents and we just let ourselves do that, which is uh, one of the things that I enjoy the most uh, of scientific research. Okay, so how do we make the swimmers? Again, uh, we use a magnetic actuation uh, such that the swimmer can propel by itself. Uh, there's no wires, there's nothing uh, that impedes motion. So in that sense, the swimmers that we have designed, uh, they're force-free. We do not push them to, to move. So we make them rotate, essentially. We make them flex. And that flexion or rotation is the um, uh, results in a, a, a manifestation of a propulsive force. And the propulsive force makes the swimmers move. And we have taken, again, the ideas of Purcell to achieve this, the locomotion of these swimmers. One is using the flexible oar mechanism in which we have a, a tail which is flexible. And this flexibility, this uh, reverse, this, this new time uh, associated with the, with the elasticity of the tail, this new characteristic time is what leads to the, to the forward motion of these uh, swimmers. And of course, we have uh, gone back to um, try to replicate this helical actuation to produce locomotion. And, and uh, as I said uh, in, my, in my summary, I will focus on the course crew mechanism for swimming, but I will first sh show you how we make uh, uh, robot sperms. Again, this will be uh, you know, a simplification of how sperm swims by using a head, and inside the head we will insert a magnet, a permanent magnet, and that it will be aligned in, in the streamwise direction of the head. Right? So now, if you um, impose a magnetic field far from the head, uh, the depending on the direction of the magnetic field, the head will try to align in the direction of the magnetic lines. Right? And then we just use a piece of uh, flexible tail. In this case, it's just a piece of optic fiber, but it can be just a, any uh, flexible filament. And we immersed the swimmer in a container inside a Helmholtz coil. The Helmholtz coil is capable of producing a very uniform magnetic field inside it. So if you feed a certain current and then you design the number of turns and you design the size of it, uh, you can produce a uniform magnetic field. So in this case, if the current is constant, the head will turn towards the direction of the magnetic field. But if we make the current to change in time to uh, go in one direction and then flip it back, then the head will wobble from side to side in time. And this is how it looks like. Um, this is a, a, a new video taken by um, Portia Tizi, who's uh, actually doing the research this summer, if you believe, if you believe that uh, at Brown, uh, in, at her dorm, and we actually moved the Helmholtz call to her dorm, uh, to replicate this experiment that we had done before and now here at Brown. So this is how it looks like. Again, as I said, this is immersed in this Helmholtz coil. And when we flip the direction of the magnetic field, the head uh, bobs, uh, in this case, up and down. And because of the flexibility of the, of the tail, you, it leads to propulsion, right? It's beautiful. This is an experiment uh, that was done by other one of my students uh, before. Uh, uh, it, it's just uh, to show you that Purcell was right. You know, if you have a flexible tail, this guy will swim. But if the tail is very rigid, you know, the same head, but the tail here is uh, uh, very stiff, there's no, it doesn't swim. And this guy swims. It's not, not a very good swimmer, but it does swim. Now, uh, we take the same idea of magnetic actuation that leads to locomotion, but now we want to test the other swimming strategy, which is swimming by the rotation of a helix. So we now we flip, uh, uh, we flip the magnet, uh, the, the permanent magnet in the head. So now it has this orientation like this. And, and, and now 
we immerse this uh, device into a magnetic field that is rotating, then the head will align to the external magnetic field and everything will rotate. The head will rotate. And since we attach this uh, uh, helix to the head, everything will rotate. So what do we do to make a rotating magnetic field? We make a magnetic field that rotates just like this, right? It's, 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 a, it's a silly answer if you, if you know what I mean, you know? You have a magnetic, you, you rotate everything. And again, uh, we have a, a certain volume of fluid inside that has this constant magnetic field that is rotating in time. And we have a container there and we put our swimmers there. So this is how it looks. Uh, at, at first, you know, the, the, the compound coil is not um, energized, but once we energize it, the head rotates at the imposed rotation rate of the Helmholtz coil. And since it, since it rotates and the tail is attached firmly to the head, everything rotates and, and the swimmer swims. So it's very clean, very elegant. And uh, as I said here, it's uh, of centimetric scale. Uh, and we can just film it using a video camera. And we match, we make the, the Reynolds number to be small by making the viscosity of the fluid very large in comparison to water, right? So the Reynolds number for this guy that you're seeing here, it's about um, 10 to the minus three, 10 to the minus two, I'm sorry. Now, so uh, the, the next challenge is to, now that we have this device, we, the, the, the next thing to do is to fill the container with a fluid that is non-Newtonian, but it retains only one of the two main characteristics of this non-Newtonian rheology that we want to address. So we want to either have a fluid that has viscoelasticity, but does not have shear, the, the, but the viscosity is constant, and these are so-called bogger fluids. And uh, again, if you ever work with bogger fluids, uh, then you know that this is uh, much harder to do uh, than you would think. But uh, and also uh, uh, on the flip side, you also want to test what is the effect of shear thinning viscosity. So you can have this fluid that does not have elasticity, but its viscosity changes if you change the shear rate. And we have done that. Uh, again, uh, we have mm, found this recipe and a procedure to produce fluids that if you measure the viscosity, it's nearly constant. These empty circles are the viscosity of this fluid, but they exhibit the first normal stress difference, which is significantly, sig uh, sig significantly large. So, you can actually fit this to a or or B model to calculate the relax the elastic relaxation time of that fluid, and once you do that, then you make a um, a mix of glucose and water that matches the same viscosity of the Bogger fluid, but does not exhibit any first normal stress difference. So we have a one to one comparison, exact same viscosity, but one fluid is elastic and the other fluid is uh, Newtonian. And we have done a similar idea, but with the shear thinning fluids. So we found this um, recipe in which you, mesh, you mix ethylene glycol carbopole, which is a polymer, um, and that makes a fluid that shear thins, the, vis the viscosity reduces with shear rate. Uh, but if you try to measure the first normal stress difference in a rheometer, it's negligible. That means that it's, uh, um, elastic relaxation time is very small. So it's uh, nearly inelastic. It's never completely inelastic, but it's, for practical terms, the shear thinning effect dominates over the elastic effect. And of course, we make a fluid that is Newtonian, and we have a, two fluids that have the same order of magnitude of viscosity, but one shear thins and the other one doesn't. Okay, all right, all right, good. So let me first uh, show you uh, some of the results that we have obtained by making these uh, swimmers with a helical tail in shear thinning fluids, shear thinning inelastic fluids. So he, here is a cartoon of the swimmer. We designed the, um, what is the pitch, 
uh, this, the, the length of the tail, the length of the head, we can vary this. In this case, we fix these parameters to a certain value and we just make them swim using our rotating Helmholtz coil. And again, what, the, what you're seeing here is the speed of swimming as a function of the rotation rate. And this is just the raw data. Again, if the fluid is Newtonian, we hit this nice linear relationship between the swimming speed and the rotation rate. Again, this line is the match uh, of it's a simple Newtonian modeling. But now, if you do the exact same swimmer, and now you place it in these shear thinning fluids, again, for different values of the power uh, coefficient, again, if it's n is equal to one, then you're back to a Newtonian fluid. And as n decreases, that means that the fluid uh, reduces its viscosity faster, right? And you see that in every case, for identical uh, conditions, same swimmer, John changing the, the, the type of fluid, then the swimming speed increases as a function uh, for a certain frequency. Mm -hmm. And again, it's mostly uh, linear. And we want to see what is the effect of this, the value of this n on to the swimming of these helices. So if we, if we um, calculate the ratio of the non Newtonian swimming to the Newtonian swimming as a function again of the rotation rate, then we see that it's more or less constant. If you, I, I will ask you to ignore these low frequency values because you're dividing very small numbers, so it gets very noisy. But if you just take a, uh, take a look at this um, high rotation rates, then uh, for all cases, this ratio is greater than one. That means that you, if you're swimming in a shear thinning fluid, you would swim faster. Right? And it's relatively constant after a certain frequency. So if, now if we take the value of this uh, horizontal region of this constant region as a function of n, then we find that you know this 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 would be the Newtonian case over here. And as as you make the fluid to shear thin more, then the the swimming speed increases up to a certain point in uh, uh, a, a, a fluid of 0 0.6, and then it begins to decrease again, but it always greater than one. So they always swim faster in a shear thinning fluid. So the conclusion of this is that, you know, uh, when you have a shear thinning fluid that has no elastic effects, you always observe a faster swimming speed. And um, this is, of course, in agreement with many other studies that have addressed this problem, uh, in particular uh, Leonardo Cani, in using a numerical method, they found the same uh, similar result uh, by simulating a waving Taylor sheet. And what they found and what we argue in our result is that the enhanced swimming speed is the result of this confinement effect, right? Basically, as the helix is spinning, it generates a cloud of low viscosity fluid that is encapsulated onto a region of high viscosity. So this is, um, is a, the, the, the classical confinement effect in which you can move uh, faster if you're near to a wall in, um, in a low Reynolds number environment. Okay. So now let's turn uh, the page to helical swimmers and viscoelastic fluids. Again, by trying to remove layers of complexity by only considering viscoelastic fluids that have constant viscosity. And I have here two important results. Uh, one is by um, Saverio Spagnoli and, and collaborators in which they did this experiment uh, using a computer. It's a numerical simulation. And again, is the swimming speed normalized by the Newtonian swimming speed as a function of the Deborah number. What they found is that in some cases, the swimming speed can be larger than that of a Newtonian. And in some other cases, the swimming speed can be actually lower than in Newtonian case, right? So we have this, this one of these papers that has a split decision. It can go faster or it can go slower, depending especially on the, both the Deborah number, but also on the geometry of the helix. This is interesting. And this is an experiment in which um, uh, it's by, by the group of, uh, of, of Kenny Brewer, who is now my, uh, my colleague here at Brown. Again, it's the same idea is the swimming speed uh, normalized by the Newtonian swimming speed is a function of Deborah number. And they found that it actually peaks at Deborah number equal to one, right? 
but they also found that the pitch angle, if you look at these empty symbols and the field symbols, the pitch angle also influences the value of these of this units, right? One important thing that I'd like to mention is that the increase is not very large. Here is about 5% and here is about 15%. So, so we went ahead and did this experiment, try to you know, contribute to this understanding. So this is the same swimmer that I showed you before. He has a certain pitch angle uh, and he has a head and we went through all this trouble to make the swimmer swim in this beautifully designed bogger fluid and with this rotating helix, and we found that it doesn't make a difference. Right? Uh, I thought that was a really interesting result, but um, uh, Francisco Godinez, who was my postdoc at the time, was highly disappointed because this is a result that shows you that after all of that you've done, it doesn't make a difference. Uh, and of course, uh, by continuous in going to the DFD meetings and reading all the literature, we know that this is not fully resolved yet. So what we went is, we would, would we, the next step was to vary the geometry by uh, changing the, the pitch angle of the helix, maybe changing its size with respect to the size of the head. So we have a, a zoo of different synthetic swimmers uh, so that, such that we can test these ideas. Again, we have this uh, device, and so we can now play uh, play God. We can make bacteria that would never exist, but we make them exist in this synthetic world. And this is what we found. So uh, this is the swimming speed in millimeters per second, a function of the frequency of rotation. And we found something interesting. When the helix is the pitch angle of the helix is very shallow. The swimming speed of the bogger in the bogger fluid is smaller than the swimming speed in the Newtonian. So the velocity is decreased. When we have a pitch angle which is intermediate, we see no difference. This is the previous result that I showed you. But when we have a, a helix that has a pitch angle which is very steep, like in this cartoon over here, the swimming speed in the viscoelastic fluid is faster than the swimming speed in the Newtonian fluid. And it's sort of in, in agreement with the numerical paper. So this plot shows you the non-Newtonian swimming speed uh, normalized with the Newtonian speed as a function of error for all of those swimmers. And of course, uh, clearly the Deborah number doesn't tell us the story, it's more than that, no? This line here is the calculation of Eric in 2007. This is the paper that basically reignited this field. And he was right, but only for the case when the wavelength is very long, which is in, in agreement with this calculation. No? Uh, this, this, um, these red dots are for a shallowest uh, helical swimmer, and this is for a steepest helical swimmer. So again, this paper has been in preparation for more than three years and we have not published it because we don't understand yet what is happening. So let me tell you some arguments of what we're trying to come up to explain this behavior. Right? So now we play, plot the same, the same idea, but now um, as a function of the uh, normalized pitch angle, basically this is the angle of the helix. This would be a very high angle, and this very very small angle on, this, on here. And you see that there is a, a, a monotonic trend uh, of increasing from going below one to greater than one. Most importantly, is this the fact that we found that the swimming ski speed can be up to five times the speed of a Newtonian fluid, which is extremely higher, much higher than, the, than the, the case of the increase found by uh, Kenny Brewer and his collaborators. Uh, and it's also higher than that found uh, numerically by, by Saverio and his collaborators. Uh, but again, no, uh, we're seeing that, and, and by the way, this uh, dispersion here is because this is for different Deborah numbers, right? So we still need to we know that both Deborah number and pitch uh, make an, uh, an impact on this. So let's, um, again, I've been, we've been trying to come up with an explanation for these results. 
So if you take first, just uh, forget about the head for a second. If you do the calculation from resistive force theory uh, for a Newtonian fluid, you see that the, the, the swimming speed is proportional to the anisotropy ratio and the pitch angle of the helix. If for one second you allow yourself to believe that this is true in the non-Newtonian case, it would be the same except, this, again, the angle would be the angle of the helix, but now you would have a different value of the anisotropy coefficient that would be applicable to a non-Newtonian fluid. Again, this might be completely wrong, but just, just for the sake of argument, let's skip this. So with this idea, you can actually calculate the ratio of the non-Newtonian swimming to the Newtonian swimming, and it gives you a nice expression because we have the value for the Newtonian case, and we have that this ratio would be depending on the angle of the helix and this unknown value of the uh, anisotropy ratio for the viscoelastic fluid. So we try to, to see if this expression matches our measurements. And it doesn't, right? So for a small angle, this ratio could only be less than one if the anisotropy coefficient is, small, is in between one and two. Again, you just take a look at the, at the value of, this, of the angle for the small values and then you take the asymptotic limit. So that means that this, it's really, it would be reasonable. No? Maybe we can argue that this is the case. But now, if you change to a large uh, uh, pitch angle of the helix, you no longer, then, then the, the anisotropy ratio would have to be greater than two in order for the ratio to be greater than one. So what this uh, tells us, I don't know what it tells us. It just tells us that the anisotropy constant, anisotropy coefficient is not constant with the angle. But it might also tell you that this resistive force theory for non Newtonian fluids, it's not proper. But it just gives us some uh, a way to think about where, where to go from here. Okay. And where to go from here is, is, is the following uh, set of slides. We have um, modified a very fancy RSG2 rheometer to attach a helical um, element here. And we can actually measure uh, the thrust, the drag, and the torque by immersing this into a container. And we do this for both a Bogler fluid and a Newtonian fluid. And the sad part, you know, again, this is the torque, the, the torque, the drag, and the thrust, all the, the three elements that you need for resistive force theory, is that if you do these measurements for the Newtonian fluid and the viscoelastic fluid, they look very similar. There's not a significant difference. So this doesn't help us to understand why uh, uh, the changes in swimming speed. Now we, we try harder. We do PIV. We immerse these helices onto a container and illuminate with fluid tracers, and we take a horizontal slice of the flow, and we see the Newtonian um, velocity field and the viscoelastic velocity field. And, and again, this is very preliminary. This is uh, just a couple of weeks old. But there's not a significant difference. The, the, the flow field retains its, its uh, fundamental features. There's not a significant variation of the flow field between this and this. So again, this is a, a, a negative result. It doesn't change significantly. We will continue to push forward with this, but uh, so far it's not telling us what we need to do, how, how to explain our, our measurements. Right? What we do know is that the viscoelasticity can enhance, hinder, or not affect the swimming speed, and the geometry and uh, the Deborah number do matter significantly. Okay, so we're we're thinking about uh, uh, what to do next, what to uh, how to complement our arguments, but there's no happy ending yet. Okay, so in the rest of the talk, I will flash uh, some slides of other experiments that have been inspired by the development of this uh, neat uh, new way to make experiments with synthetic swimmers. And again, I don't know, I chose this adjective. I think it's an awesome setup. It was designed by my students, by the way, uh, but it's very clean, it's very elegant, and it's a new way to test the fluid. You have a fluid and you 
you know, mess with it uh, at, at a distance without inserting a stick or anything like that. You just excite it somehow. And then you observe uh, how it reacts by swimming in this case, or by any other thing that you can think. So I will show you some very quick results of how a helical swimmer crosses an interface or a gradient, gradient of viscosity. It's also very important in biological applications. I'll tell you the short story of an amazing snowman. We have used this for, um, we have actually changed the fluid significantly. We have done experiments in sand and we are messing up with the classical um, sedimentation of a sphere experiment. Uh, and I will try to be, again, this will be quick, uh, just to, I, I just want to share this with you because I, I find it very interesting. And again, uh, this is the, the, the case in which we make our swimmer to, to go through an interface or a gradient. And this is, um, our idea is, is that this should model certain mechanical process of how bacteria penetrate the cellular wall to cause infections or how these bacteria go through these uh, gels to cause infection in this case of a this this helical bacteria uh, uh, that affects the um, uh, intestinal system okay so again here is a movie it speaks in more than many words so we have our helical swimmer is doing this thing and here you have two fluids that have identical viscosities on the top and on the bottom. But then since they are immiscible, there's a surface tension in between. So of course, when the swimmer finds the interfacial tension, it's a spring that it retains it there for a long time. But eventually it makes it through. And once it pierces the interface, the interface actually helps it uh, propel forward. You can see here the formation of a cusp over here and it just makes it through and then you're sick. No? That's the idea. And if you're interested, there's a paper about this, right? Uh, and I, I don't have a movie for this, but we have done the same experiment, but now we do two uh, fluids that have different viscosities. The one in the, in the bottom has low viscosity and the one on top has high viscosity. There's slightly um, density mismatch such that we can retain the stratification, but in this case, they're missable. And we can observe how, what, what is the process that the swimmer goes through uh, uh, to be able to cross this interface. So if we take into consideration that viscosity does not appear explicitly in the resistive force theory calculation, then the swimmer should go through at a constant speed uh, without any trouble. And this is not what we see. We see for this case, for instance, uh, that uh, the swimmer goes at a constant speed, then when it reaches the interface at zero, its speed is significantly decreased. And then when it makes it through, it recovers uh, another constant speed. Again, these two speeds are different because it's slightly stratified. Uh, again, we have these nice measurements and we have this uh, awesome modeling by uh, Christian Esparza, who is uh, one of uh, Eric Logos' PhD students. And we're uh, working on a, on a manuscript and should be finished very soon. But again, it's very clean, it's a very elegant way to test these ideas in a, in a wider environment than just uh, homogeneous fluids. Now, amazing snowman is another idea uh, that uh, Eric and his students came up with. The idea is that you, you have a dimer of spheres of two different sizes, you know, if you rotate them, then if the fluid is Newtonian, nothing happens, but if the fluid is Newtonian, this rotation rate will generate a certain normal force that will be different from that of a, of a normal force that is induced by the rotation of a smaller sphere. So they calculated that. So a, this guy should swim at a certain speed. This dimer will swim at a certain speed depending on the Deborah number, also on the size ratio of the two swimmers. And we did that. We did that experiment because we have this awesome oscillate, uh, a rotating helical device, and that's how it looks. You know, they're not swimming at the same time. I just superpose them just to just to show you how it looks. Right? Again, it's rotating, and it it swims in the direction of the smaller sphere because the normal stress in the big sphere is larger than the normal stress of the smaller sphere. And the numer and the experimental results match very well 
with this uh, calculation, this modeling uh, by um, Anshun Pat, uh, who was one of the Eric students at the time. We can, we can swim in sand, I'm almost done. So uh, again, it turns out that some animals like to swim in sand, and this is a movie from, um, from Goldman in Georgia Tech. These lizards actually go through sand, and what they have found is that they undergo this oscillatory motion, which is very similar to that of a, uh, a microorganism. But you know, they, uh, in this case, they, once it goes into sand, it just undergoes this sinusoidal type motion. Right? So we have done, you know, immerse our helical swimmers, you can see the head here, in the same sand, and they swim. Of course they swim. Huh? And it turns out, most interestingly, is that the resistive force theory, you can adapt it to sand, and it does a very good job. Right? If you plot here is the speed as a function of pitch angle, this is a prediction by resistive force theory, and it matches the experimental measurements of these helical swimmers in sand. Lastly, uh, again, we have this device. We're able to make something rotate without touching it. So uh, we went back to classical problem in fluid mechanics. It's just to release the sphere in a fluid and let it sediment. Uh, so the speed of sedimentation should be a function of the size, of its weight, and also on the viscosity of the fluid. So it's a very good way to, it's, a, it's one of the foundation stones of fluid mechanics, if you ask me. But now we want to, you know, do that with a twist. You know? We just give it a new, a new, a fresh new twist to this classical problem. Uh, here is the movie. You know? We have the device here. And you can actually see the, the rotating uh, Helmholtz coil in front of the camera. So now the, bo the ball is sedimenting, but it's also rotating, and we measure its sedimentation speed. This is how it looks like for a Newtonian fluid, no? for different rotation frequencies. This is the calculation by the Stokes flow. And it's, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't matter if it's rotating as it's sedimenting, as it should in a Newtonian fluid in a low Reynolds number flow. But now, if we test a viscoelastic fluid, at first, at lower rotation rates, you're not exciting the viscoelastic properties too much. Uh, but then after a certain uh, threshold of excitement of uh, inducing these additional stresses, then the sphere begins to sediment at a faster rate. So this again, this is a rheometer, right? You're just uh, measuring the, the nature of the fluid by adding another uh, amount of shear in addition to that of the shear produced by the sedimentation of the sphere. And we have also done it for uh, this other class of fluids that we, I told you about, this uh, shear thinning in elastic fluids. And again, if it's a Newtonian fluid, it doesn't make a difference. They sediment at the same rate. But if it's shear thinning fluid, as if you increase the shear rate, then it sediments at a faster rate. So um, it's, it's, it's great, if you ask me. OK. Well, so again, well, thank you for your attention. Uh, it's been great to tell you about all the things that we've been doing with these uh, synthetic swimmers. And again, it's just an effort to contribute to what is the effect of having a non-Newtonian rheology on the swimming speed of microorganisms. But again, by, by cheating, by not using microorganisms, by using these model experiments to test theories and to try to find different ways to uh, um, a better understanding of these types of flows. Uh, and just uh, just to, not to repeat myself, this is a summary of what we have done. And we have found many new applications for the system. And with that, I finished. And I show you one last crazy idea is to use many tails uh, to swim in these devices. It's a tail with a, a swimmer with a multi tail, you know, just like bacteria. And we can actually find what is the, the most efficient uh, number of tails that you need to have to to improve your swimming performance. And with that, I finished, and I thank you for your attention.